In May 1940, Hitler's forces stormed through France, crushing all opposition. At the heart of their rapid advance was a new military elite, the Waffen-SS, combat troops with a fierce devotion to the Third Reich. Our motto was duty, loyalty, the fatherland, and comradeship. The Waffen-SS were the ideological standard bearers for the Nazi leadership, and they were notorious for barbaric crimes. They got no kindness towards your man at all, or man or woman or child. They kill everything in the mist. At their wartime peak, they numbered nearly a million men, and in battle, they were utterly fearless. For them, death was almost inevitable. They expected to die, but they were also brutal when it came to killing. The Waffen-SS, literally the Weapon-SS, were Hitler's most loyal military force, rivaling the regular German army. In the 1930s, young Germans were desperate to enlist. As a Hitler youth leader, it was the done thing for me to join the Waffen-SS. All my predecessors were in the guard regiments or were officers there, and so I naturally wanted to join the guards as well. The Waffen-SS had grown out of Hitler's Schutzstaffel, his unit of personal bodyguards. It was a great honor to join. When I received the call-up order, I ran all over town. I was so happy to be called up. You see, only three or four men out of 80 were accepted at the medical examinations. The others just ended up in the German army, not in the Waffen-SS. In a time of high unemployment, the Waffen-SS offered an honorable career at the heart of the new Nazi state. Kurt Sammertreiter was one of many new recruits. And then I said to my father, listen, how about if I went into the SS? All I'd need to do is four years, like an apprenticeship, and then I can be a civil servant. Perhaps you already knew a little bit more about the whole thing, but I got my way. In four years, I'll come back as a civil servant. I'm going. But the soldiers of the Waffen-SS were servants of the Nazi regime. The head of the SS, Heinrich Himmler, wanted a unique new force, an army of ideologically committed elite troops to rival the regular army. As the Germans swept through France, the Waffen-SS was under the army's operational control. But many regular soldiers suspected the Nazis' long-term plans. Hitler and the generals assured the German army again and again that it was the one and only armed force of the state. Now, it became absolutely clear that another force was being built up alongside the German army that wanted to contend with the army for power. In France, one particular division gained immediate notoriety, the Leibstandarte Adolf Hitler, Hitler's personal bodyguard. Before the war, this unit had been dedicated to Hitler's personal protection, but now it was fighting on the front, giving the French a foretaste of what to expect from the Nazis. We did come across Hitler's personal bodyguard unit, the Leibstandarte, who'd leave behind marks so that the reinforcements would know where they were. They had smashed up all the crucifixes throughout Catholic France. That was out-and-out out heathenism, but at the time we didn't realize it. The Waffen-SS was schooled to be the revolutionary shock troops of the Reich. By mid-1940, it was already 100,000 strong. SS leaders expected recruits like Gary and Goldman to be the crusaders of a barbaric new religion. Then some big shot came from Berlin, and we had to swear that we would not tell anyone what we were about to hear. 
They said it was a strictly secret official matter. And then the chap said to us that the victory would only be won when all the churches were ransacked. Not just the Jews, but also the Christians. They all had to be got rid of first. Christ was an illegitimate son of a Jewish whore. That was the official view of Christ, you see. The army tried to stop this fanatical new force becoming too large and too well armed. It was hard to deny the military prowess of the SS units laying waste to Europe. But the regular army criticized them for being all show and lacking traditional military expertise. For their part, the Waffen SS despised the army as cautious and old fashioned. The commander of the Leibstandarte was Sepp Dietrich, a First World War veteran. Of course, we didn't think anything of his leadership qualities because he didn't have any experience. He had only been a sergeant in the First World War, you see. And even after that, he never enjoyed any higher military training. Dietrich's lack of training as a battlefield commander was apparent on the front line. His briefing was strange, to say the least. He just said, attack this, attack that, and you must all then come to some arrangement. It was like no briefing we were used to with clear goals and clear boundaries, but rather, we'll do it like that then. You go to the right, and you go to the left, and I'll watch out, and so on. But the Waffen-SS soon showed that while some lacked training in battle, they had an unequaled capacity for cold-blooded killing. As the Luftwaffe bombed from the skies, German troops continued their unstoppable advance. In the face of this onslaught, British forces retreated towards the port of Dunkirk, embarking for the voyage back to Britain. The hundreds of thousands of retreating soldiers were given protective cover by a few French and British regiments. Among these troops was Albert Evans, then just 19 years old. Because the uh, people was getting off the beaches of Dunkirk, we was told that we'd, we'd got to hold our position at all costs, like, you know, so we held it as long as we could. On the 28th of May, Albert Evans and his fellow soldiers were surrounded by troops from the merciless Leibstandarte. Then the line just up at the end of a gable end and they got the machine gun on the road. They weren't very pleasant people to meet at all, none whatsoever. I mean, our officer pleaded with the one SS and he said, the point of where you're going is the point of no return. We was put into a field, and uh, they put us into a barn, and that's when the when I started calling five out, and shot five first, then I called another five out, shot them, then chaps were getting a bit edgy, and the next thing I seen the jelly bending down, taking a a grenade out of his boot and slinging it in. Whether I caught the blast of that grenade, I don't know. But as I fell to the floor, the officer grabbed me, took this arm, and come on, Evans, he said, run for it. And we run out the barn, round. And of course, they got four of their men up the side of the barn, and they fired at us. The captain who saved my life and got killed in doing so. I must have stood up, and I got hit in this shoulder. It was only a stray bullet, but uh, I was all right. I, bleeding from my arm, bleeding from my shoulder, bleeding from my neck. I still struggled on and made me get away. Evans and Toombs managed to escape, but the Germans murdered 85 other soldiers at Wormhout, the first Waffen-SS massacre in the West. Altogether, the Waffen-SS killed 185 captured British soldiers during the retreat to Dunkirk. What happened to us, I don't think, didn't come under the annuals of warfare. It was a cold bloody murder. I think so, myself. The killers went unpunished. The Waffen SS encouraged ruthlessness as well as bravery. When they occupied Paris, 
the faithful soldiers of the Waffen-SS posed happily for Nazi newsreel cameras as war heroes. We were happy that it was all over. Really happy. We were so happy that for a few days we, well, basically, we got drunk. Really, you see, we just wanted to forget. We just wanted to forget. Private archive shows victorious troops of the Waffen-SS drinking themselves silly after battle. Many of these men had been farm workers or artisans, ordinary country folk. In the years to come, they formed the core of a vast army of battle-hardened fanatics, capable of great courage and sickening cruelty. In 1940, the Waffen-SS began recruiting troops from Nazi sympathizers throughout Europe. In newly occupied territories, Himmler was free to recruit as many men as he liked, without the German army setting limits. The vision of a pan-European army that would defeat communism inspired these foreign recruits. They also hoped that fighting under the Nazi flag would win them autonomy under German rule. When the Flemish leadership appealed for volunteers, they came forward in droves to fight against Bolshevism and to acquire an equal place for Flanders within the new Europe. By spring 1941, foreign volunteers had formed the first non-German SS division, the Viking. Later in the war in the Balkans, the Waffen-SS press-ganged all men considered to be of German stock. Many conscripts were shocked by the intensity of the training. We didn't have the faintest idea about the German drill, nor what the army and the military service were like in Germany. This drill, this briskness, this inflexibility, this inhumanity really hit us hard. In their barracks, young volunteers found they were getting much more than they'd bargained for. You see, in training we were really drilled with some very brutal methods. Not everyone was able to endure it. There were also some who wanted out. The only way of doing that was suicide. Recruits or volunteers, SS combat troops were trained to obey without question. Any slacking was mercilessly punished. If they didn't manage it, the whole group attracted attention and had to do extra training or something on Sundays. Then everyone went and gave the guy merry hell. He was dragged out of bed and beaten in the head and that kind of thing, so that he wouldn't give up next time, so that the troop would not be disrupted. There were some people there who just couldn't stand the pace, and so they did a bunk and hid in the basement. They were gone a long time, seven hours or so and they knew they'd be court-martialed or something, so they hanged themselves. That happened. The Waffen-SS were determined to disprove army accusations that they were amateurs. The Nazi combat elite was a new breed of military athlete, with a special training program designed by former army officer Felix Steiner. Recruits also had training in Nazi ideology. Naturally, we were shown Obviously, we were trained militarily, but above all, we were taught the principles of National Socialism at the Officers' Cadet College. And we were actually proud of it. As elite troops, that was part of the soldier's craft. The SS Cadet College at Bad Tortz was a training camp for the officers of the new force. Training was based on the dictates of a Prussian general. From 1934, Paul Hauser dedicated himself to creating an SS officer corps to outclass that of the army. Later, as foreigners joined, cadets were taught to forget any racial divide in the new Nazi force. For us, 
As far as we were concerned, every European who fought with us was equal, and so these differences didn't exist any longer. You see, I even had German junior leaders under my command who had to obey me, although I was Flemish, and that was not a problem at all. By 1941, the Waffen-SS numbered 220,000 men. As Northern Europeans, they all believed they belonged to the Germanic master race. In retrospect, I think that there was a very strong spirit of comradeship, which was based on the same beliefs, so to speak, based on the fact that we were convinced we were conducting a just fight, that we were convinced of being a master race. We were the best of this master race, and that really does form a bond. On the 22nd of June, 1941, the Nazis invaded Russia. Hitler wanted the Bolshevik Empire speedily crushed. At first, the Waffen-SS and the German army had it all their own way. We were filthy and covered in dust, but we pushed on eastwards. We thought, good grief, if it carries on like this, it'll be even faster than France. We didn't even think about how far, that there were still 12,000 kilometers to go. We just saw all the war machinery we destroyed and the endless lines of prisoners. We didn't have to deal with them, but subsequent units did. It was bad. The Waffen-SS starved thousands of prisoners to death. Many others were shot on the spot. There was a row of Russian soldiers, obviously prisoners, and a group of SS soldiers getting ready, lining up to shoot these prisoners of war dead. The SS corporal said, ach, lieutenant, they are just brutes. I suppose that was representative of the ideology and explains how those in the Waffen-SS, even a corporal, could decide to execute prisoners of war who no longer even had weapons, just because it suited them. SS soldiers often killed their own prisoners personally, one on one. But regular soldiers also committed atrocities. The German army proudly proclaimed it had hunted down and hanged these Jews. For the Nazis, this was a war to subjugate Slavs and exterminate Jews and Bolsheviks. The Waffen-SS followed their orders slaughtering any potential political opponents. In Borisovo, 25 people were arrested straight away. The village activists, they were the head of the Kolkots, the collective farm and their deputies, as if they'd been following a list. A trench had already been dug. The SS soldiers said they were partisans. In October 1941, troops from the Das Reich division of the SS seized Borisovo. A massacre followed. When the order to shoot came in German, a young boy, the son of one of the heads of the Kolkot, said, Father, I won't let them take you. So they shot him dead too. But within weeks, Hitler's blitzkrieg on Russia foundered. The fierce Russian winter set in with a vengeance, and neither the German army nor the Waffen-SS were prepared for it. Minus 46 degrees. Minus 46 degrees and no overcoat. More froze to death than were wounded. Well, I honestly admit, I often cried out for my mother. In atrocious conditions, the elite SS troops remained resolute. I saw how my fellow soldiers' ears fell off. So we got some rope and tied our ears to our heads, and that's how we coped.
When Russians fell, there was a rush to get their uniforms off as quickly as possible, before they got cold, so that we had something warm to put on. The Russians fought back in defense of Moscow. Stalin ordered well-equipped Siberian troops into battle against the Waffen-SS. We beat the Germans and caused the SS huge losses. Suddenly our mood changed. We were so thrilled that we had made the legendary SS take flight. It was the first ever major retreat by the Waffen-SS, ending the legend of their invincibility. The term retreat was dishonorable. It just wasn't done. And therefore, for us, it was as if we had made a mess of it, as if we had done something wrong. We were finished, absolutely done for. I mean, right at rock bottom, both psychologically and physically. December 1941, was a turning point on the Russian front. It was the counter-attack outside Moscow that convinced us that we could win this war. We had an encounter with a German SS division and we won. We were fighting for our homeland and the Germans were on foreign soil. Against heavy odds, the Waffen-SS flung themselves into the heart of the battle, often leading German counter-attacks. Their bravery won them new admirers among the officers and ranks of their old rival, the German army. If you were leading a division and you had a Waffen-SS unit alongside you, then you were perfectly happy because they were excellent, extremely courageous soldiers, and they were on the whole much better equipped than we were. And so you felt quite safe if you were able to lean on a Waffen-SS unit. The devastating resolve of the Waffen-SS was not to be underestimated. When we were supposed to fight against the SS, we were expressly told Comrades, you are going to fight against the SS troops. Be on your guard. Be vigilant. It was suicide. As long as they were not dead or at least wounded, you knew they would fight until the bitter end. Almost invariably, the Waffen-SS fought to the death. Their reputation for cruelty left them little alternative. We counted on the fact, especially we from the Waffen-SS, that they wouldn't take any prisoners, that they would stand us up against the wall straight away. And so we fought until the last bullet. For the first time, the Waffen-SS feared defeat. When it came to the attack, believe me, nearly everyone had to quickly go and spend a penny. You just got the urge. It came from fear. It came from fear. It came from angst. But years of bitter fighting had left many incapable of mercy. After a few years, they became so desensitized that they didn't even notice anymore, given that they were capable of just bumping someone off without batting an eyelid. Let's just say, they would need to develop a lot of their humanity again, and that takes time. There was vicious hand-to-hand -hand combat. There is a Russian then a Russian jumped on me, this tremendously tall bloke. I don't really like to speak about it, what I did then. I bit him, you see, but in the throat. When you want to live, you will do anything. By 1943, 
A third of all Waffen-SS troops had fallen in Russia. Their corpses littered the battlefields. SS orderly Rudolf Porsche saw many undignified deaths. When born so when such young comrades were lying dead in bed, doubled up like a hedgehog. Then I often thought, if your mother were here to see you now, Despite the defeat at Stalingrad, Hitler retained his unquenchable faith in the Waffen-SS. He expected them to win him many other famous victories. In March 1943, German forces attacked Kharkov, one of the biggest cities in the Soviet Union. Soldiers from the fanatical Leibstandarte were among the first to set foot there. At one point, there was this silly saying that the Leibstandarte saw it as their mission to lay Kharkov at Hitler's feet. And that motivation was certainly there, let's not fool ourselves. Their victory was short-lived. The Red Army soon launched a vigorous counterattack. The Leibstandarte division suffered catastrophic losses, far heavier than on the battlefields in France. Ninety percent of our tank regiment was wiped out. Newsreels for the homeland showed nothing of the SS losses or of their war crimes. When the Soviets recaptured Kharkov, they discovered evidence of a horrific SS murder in a military hospital. Eyewitnesses included a hospital doctor. SS soldiers threw incendiary grenades through the windows. The buildings began to burn, and the wounded tried to save themselves. Many of the wounded were burned alive. In April 1943, Himmler visited Kharkov to be greeted by Obergruppenführer Paul Hauser. The SS leader had no qualms about the methods his men were using. In summer 1944, southwest France was the setting for another Waffen SS atrocity. The 10th of June 1944 was the decisive day in my life. That day, men from the Das Reich division of the Waffen SS set off for Orador. In the morning, you have breakfast with your family, and then in the evening, your family is dead. There is no one left, no houses, nothing. The citizens of Orador hoped they'd soon be free of Nazi rule. Just a few days before, on the 6th of June, the Western Allies had landed in Normandy. There were sporadic uprisings and a wave of attacks on German troops. In Orador, the Waffen-SS retaliated with ferocity. Many still believe this was a perfectly honorable response. Orador? Orador? Well, many of us still go over there today. I also wanted to go over once. They are warmly welcomed, the SS, even those who at the time were from the Das Reich Division. Orador Sir Glan paid a disastrous price for attempts at resistance. 
the Waffen SS gathered the villagers in the marketplace. The men were separated from the women and children. I said goodbye to my mother and my wife. I embraced them one last time, and we saw the SS lead them inside the church. The women and children were locked inside the church. The men were led to a barn, where the SS opened fire on them. They're crazy, I thought. Crazy. With the first salvo, I was hit twice in my lower leg. Then I fell and got another two in my thigh. All my friends fell on top of me. That's what saved me. They saved me. Then the whole village was burnt to the ground. Fire is a terrible thing, and so I decided to flee. I was convinced that I was going to die because they were outside the door. But I would rather die from a bullet than in a fire. Robert Ebra and Marcel Datou were among the handful who managed to escape the massacre. Almost all the women and children herded into the church, burnt to death inside. My father came up to me crying and said, there's no point looking for anyone. They're all dead. That was awful. The French have preserved the charred ruins of Orador as a stark reminder of Waffen-SS infamy. You see, the physical injuries heal, but the wounds of the soul, they remain all your life. While Orador went up in flames, the battle for Normandy intensified. The Waffen-SS, desperate for new manpower, recruited males aged 14 to 18. The Hitler Youth Division was in the thick of the fighting. Officially, they were all volunteers. But many of them were forced. They had enlisted for the Air Corps or whatever, and then ended up fighting in Normandy. The Reich's youth leader, Arthur Axmann, was determined to form a new SS division. He recruited 20,000 teenagers direct from the ranks of the Hitler Youth. When it was founded, we didn't like the name at all, because it sounded really childish. We wanted to be real soldiers, you see. The youngest among us didn't get any cigarettes. Well, they didn't smoke anyway. They actually got sweets. Confectionery. Nicknamed the baby soldiers by the Allies, they fought with a bravery that belied their age. They were fighters, really. Um, a lot of them fought right to the bitter end. They wouldn't give up. They'd been programmed to believe the final victory would be theirs. The battle for Normandy ended in disastrous defeat for the Waffen-SS. Even Hitler's devoted Leibstandarte faced total destruction as a fighting force. The Allied Air Force relentlessly attacked the remnants of the Waffen-SS and the German army. The superiority of the opposition in the air was so remarkable, you may be amazed that we didn't ask ourselves what the point of fighting was. I ask myself that today. At the time, we didn't ask. Young recruits met their death or were changed forever. When they came back from action, they looked half dead, grey in the face, afraid, but nevertheless responsive. If someone gave them orders, they carried them out. Even in death, the newcomers stayed loyal to the Reich. 
A young lad who died in my arms, whose eyes I closed as I cried like a baby, said to me, Lieutenant, ask the leader of my company to write to my mother and tell her I died as a brave soldier for my Führer and my fatherland. SS Chief Heinrich Himmler had always demanded undying obedience. Hitler now called on him to mobilize his last reserves. It was said that if anyone could drum up something out of what was left by way of troops and weapons and so on, then Himmler was the man. Short of manpower, Himmler was forced to adapt his selection policy. From 1943, he even allowed Balkan Muslims into the Waffen-SS. Remarkably, you no longer had to have German roots to be an SS soldier. And of course, a lot of the older SS people really did screw their noses up at the fact that Muslims were now, as it were, being admitted into the blue-eyed Aryan elite. There was also a division of Ukrainian Slavs. By 1944, the Waffen-SS was 900,000 strong. With 200,000 non-Germans helping to fight its racial wars, the Waffen-SS had become a multinational army. Now the masses were called up, there were more and more divisions. And after that, our fighting morale was never really the same as it had been before. December 1944 brought the last major German push to the west. As the Allies approached the German frontier, Hitler ordered another offensive in the Belgian Ardennes. The Waffen-SS mounted a formidable surprise attack. In practice, we were the second wave. On the 16th of December, the offensive began and we were deployed just before Christmas. Christmas Eve, we attacked. That was the first attack. It went pretty quickly, and the Yanks were pretty demoralized. For a short time, German forces advanced once more. Yet again, the Waffen-SS left a trail of barbaric war crimes behind them. At Stavelo, troops of the Leibstandarte Adolf Hitler division murdered civilians. At Malmedy, they shot dead American prisoners of war. Some were killed with a bullet to the base of the skull. Well equipped and fresh to battle, the Allies soon renewed their advance. By contrast, the once proud Waffen-SS was in total disarray. We were 40 or 50 kilometers into Belgium, and our vehicle had to get to Cologne for petrol. And there was one and a half meters of snow and ice. It took us four days to get there and back. Despite momentous losses, the Waffen-SS kept fighting. The Nazis' combat elite was reduced to a patchwork army. Every day we just broke up another tank for spare parts, always the worst tank. Every day the driver and the marksman had to give a report on which tank we were to sacrifice this time. And so it carried on until we had no tanks left. In December 1944, on Hitler's orders, Waffen-SS troops from the Viking and Death's Head divisions made their way to Hungary. Their task was to break the Soviet siege of Budapest. It was quiet, relatively quiet that New Year's Eve. I was the charging gunner on a tank. I'd got the flare ammunition, was sitting up on the back of the tank and shot my flare cartridges high and the radio operator had managed to get Lily Marlene.
Das war so eine von den Erinnerungen. That was just one of the memories. But of course there are others I would rather not think about. Budapest was an utter disaster for the Waffen SS. After seven weeks, the Hungarian capital fell to the Red Army. The attempt to end the siege had failed. Of the 22,000 SS troops in the city, 19,000 were killed. With other defeats, I think it was possible to put the blame on others, on the Italians or on the German army. But Budapest really was an SS defeat. The Waffen SS had been sent over there to break up the ring and they didn't succeed. The units defending the city included many men who'd perpetrated war crimes in Russia. Most fought to the last, fearing the retribution of the victors. I had contacts with SS people who said to me, among other things, yes, we are in a pretty bad way, but we must win because we have so much to answer for that the only thing to do is to hold out to the end. Anyone who had wavered in battle was dealt with severely. There were frequent court martials and executions. We stood there in the square and the sentence was read out. And all of a sudden the barrels were kicked away and they dangled there. And I must say, my feeling at the time was that the pigs deserved to hang because they stabbed us in the back. You don't give up in war. You don't sabotage. You have to do your duty until the end. In March 1945, Russian artillery pounded Berlin. The Waffen SS still resisted fiercely even if many were foreigners fighting under the Nazi flag. And then we really had pangs of guilt. Should we say to our people, knock off and go home? Or should we stand firm for a few more days? And yes, we did what was demanded of us. We defended Germany until the end, because we believed that we had to protect Europe, and this was the way to do it. As Adolf Hitler kept to his bunker underneath the Chancellery, foreign troops played a major role in defending him to the last. At the end, when the Russians were only about 800 meters away, a considerable percentage of those defending the Reich's Chancellery weren't Germans at all. They were Swedes, Danes, I think even Frenchmen. Many non-Germans fought to the very end in a gallant last-ditch attempt to save Hitler's life. One of the Führer's loyal defenders was Henri Fenet, a Frenchman. We didn't even think about death. Just fighting, carry on fighting. We were living and fighting, just to fight. Henri Fenet remained faithful to his vow of allegiance. Loyal until the end. Loyal unto the end. Hitler met his end in the bunker beneath the Chancellery. Closeted inside, on the 30th of April, he took his own life. The leader of the Third Reich had fallen. The central pivot was missing, so to speak. The force that had driven us all forward was missing. 
And we were afraid of what was to come. In April 1945, thousands of German soldiers crossed the Elbe to surrender to the Western Allies rather than face the vengeful Red Army. Among those giving up their arms were many men from the Waffen SS. Under interrogation, most maintained that all they had ever done was follow orders. We didn't even ask what's it all about, what for. That wasn't an issue. We were soldiers and we were given orders and carried them out. But the men of the Waffen SS were never soldiers like any other. They were conditioned to be extreme. They often flouted the accepted rules of combat. They were the living embodiment of the SS motto, give death and take death. In all, one SS soldier in three fell in combat. I think it's so terrible that so many did not come back. What did they actually die for? The English can say, we fell for the freedom of Europe, or we were fighting against a dictatorship. But what were we actually fighting for? I still have a certain underlying feeling of guilt, a shared responsibility for this catastrophe. Decades after they surrendered, some of the Waffen SS seem to be genuinely haunted by their war crimes. But even now, many defend their actions. They still believe what the Nazi leaders told them, that they were simply combat soldiers whose duty was to obey every order they were given even when this meant committing the atrocities that have shocked the world. <laughs>